to the UNSD brown bags. This is the first UNSD brown bag after the summer break or winter break, depending on your point of view. And we are happy to see so many colleagues tuning in today. So my name is Alexander Loschke, and I will be moderating this webinar today together with my colleague Sean Lovell. Today we have with us UN Secretariat colleagues Christina Goodness and Martin Welisch, who will introduce the Peace and Security Data Hub of the United Nations. The Peace and Security Data Hub is a joint deliverable of the Department of Political and Peacebuilding Affairs, DPPA, and of the Department of Peace Operations, DPO, on the Secretary General's data strategy. The hub is currently in soft launch and is expected to be formally launched uh, later this year during the World Data Forum. The Peace and Security Data Hub will enable data discovery by member states, academics, and the public, and will enable a secure data exchange among UN personnel. The hub will help to make sure that the latest and cleanest data is used when engaging with member states and when conducting analysis and informing decision making. It will make the data generated by UN Peace and Security available in one central location using a sustainable cloud-based infrastructure to securely host and share the data. In this UNSD brown bag, Priscina and Martin will present the features of the hub and want to engage in a dialogue with you about how the Peace and Security Data Hub can complement and be enriched by your work. So let me introduce now our two speakers. Um, Christina is the Chief of the Information Management Unit under uh, the DPPA DPO Shared Services. With over a decade of work experience at the United Nations, Christina continues to drive innovation in the peace and security pillar, ensuring that data is leveraged to make the right decisions at every level. Christina is one of the drafters of the SG's data strategy and has championed the Data Hub's creation in collaboration with the DPPA Innovation Cell. Martin is the team leader of the innovation cell in the policy and mediation unit of DPPA. The innovation cell is an interdisciplinary team dedicated to helping DPPA and its presences in the field to understand and explore and uh, pilot and scale new technologies, tools and practices in conflict prevention, mediation and peace building. So before I hand over to our two speakers, I just want to mention a couple of practical things like always. So we will first hear the presentation and we'll then have a Q&A session at the end. Please feel free to write your questions into the meeting chat at any time. Uh, Sean and I will monitor those questions. During the Q&A session, we would encourage you to raise your hand and to ask your question uh, yourself. But if you're a little bit shy, we can also ask the question for you. As always, this UNSD brown bag is being recorded and will be made available on the global network of data officers and statisticians at yammer.com slash unstats. We invite you to continue your discussions on the topic later on on the global network uh, after this webinar. So now, uh, over to you, Christina and Martin. Uh, the floor is now yours. Alexander, thanks so much for having us. Colleagues, good morning from, from very near New York City. Uh, we're excited to join you in this uh, first brown bag uh, session uh, after the summer break. Uh, we thought we'd do two things uh, for you or with you. We give you a run through our thinking, how this hub came about, what, what kind of the purpose is, and and, and then um, we will show you how it actually operates. So we're going to do a quick demo of the hub, and then we are excited to hear more about your thoughts and, and really engage with you in the Q&A session. That's, that's you know, uh, helpful for us to, 
to see where pain points and potential entry points for for collaboration. Uh, so that's kind of the agenda for the for the first kind of 30 minutes. Uh, and, and let me start by by sharing some slides. I'm also happy to to circulate the slides and in soft copy after after this presentation, so you have it have it available. Uh, and, and let me start with um, with saying a few words about the background. And, and obviously, you are very very well familiar with the SG's data strategy that that calls on the whole UN system uh, to prioritize data in decision making. And, and for you, that might not sound too new, but for us in the peace and security pillar, using data is still uh, a challenge. And, and many of us that are trained in political affairs and you know have taken training in international relations, uh, data analytics has not always played a great role. So kind of we are at a moment in, in the point of the organization where we are trying to make not just colleagues aware, but also give them the right infrastructure and the right skill set uh, to translate this higher vision uh, you know, towards a UN driven data organization uh, into a reality. And, and that concerns not just colleagues here at the UN headquarters, but also our colleagues in field missions. Uh, and those are you know, the PKOs and the SDMs we're supporting and, and having worked myself in the field for a long time, this is often very challenging where you are, where you have other priorities uh, and instead of, you know, having a close eye on, on, on data collection uh, or, or data analytics. Um, so, so the aim really of the data hub is to improve situational awareness and, and, and improve the situational picture for operations and programs uh, to drive informed decision making uh, by data and also ensure transparency and accountability, given that the data hub has kind of two tiers. One is a public tier, so data that is available to, to anybody uh, in the general public. And then there's a second tier which um, keeps certain data that is confidential just for use uh, by, by UN staff. Now, what is the current status? Well, how, what environment are we currently operating in, in, in the two departments, but also in our field presences? Uh, the reality is, is rather grim. Uh, um, the you know data that we operate with is scattered um, on laptops, uh, um, desktops. Uh, somebody has an Excel sheet somewhere and, and carries it over or not. Uh, I could tell you horror stories from, from some of the field presences I've been working in where you know, the data just got deleted because the person got a new laptop or moved on or, you know, uh, um, the infrastructure got lost. Um, then we see a lot of inconsistency of, of data as well. Uh, when it comes to normalization, we are really behind simply because uh, we're lacking training, but also the right uh, uh, understanding for, for the sensitivity of those issues. And, and, and that has left us with a kind of uncomfortable, uh, un uncomfortable mess, to be honest, uh, to a certain extent. Now, the aim of the hub is, is threefold. One, to really provide an opportunity for more systematic data collection. Second, to provide really easy access uh, uh, for data, not just for those who are data consumers, but also for those who are data providers. We have uh, infrastructure in place that is, again, scattered. So take the example of Unama, our largest SPM uh, in the world, um, you know, and, and you're all following what's happening in Afghanistan at the moment. Uh, we have uh, information management system in place that is, depending on which part of the statute branch you are working in, in the mission, you know, operates uh, with a certain software and, and has a certain uh, methodology. And if you work, uh, for instance, in, in the electoral affairs division there, it looks very different. So, so there's not really a systematic way of data collection happening in missions. And, and there's often not a, a kind of a normalized uh, infrastructure available. And, and on top of that, we lack connectivity between the firm missions, between the field and HQ. A lot of work has been done when it comes to, um, you know, situational reporting. Uh, but when it comes to the whole range of data that is available, think about, um, you know, number of dialogue meetings in a country or uh, think about, you know, social economic data that uh, our special political missions uh, um, collect and, and, and analyze. We haven't really um, provided the space to connect the dots uh, for each other. And on top of that, uh, the aim of the Data Hub, apart from providing the infrastructure, is uh, to create APIs so that others also outside the UN system can better connect with us. We get a lot of requests when it comes to Security Council uh, um, uh, data uh, and, and the practice of the Council where, because we don't have necessarily an infrastructure in place that, that allows member states to tap into those data streams independently and automatically, we end up with very high transaction costs, you know, sharing those information all over again. So one main aim of the data is also to have sustainable APIs so that others connect 
themselves with us and, and make use of the data that the UN provides from the peace and security pillar side. Now that, that brings us to the audience, and I'll, let me just unpack that because we have um, kind of a, a short-term aim and a long-term vision. Uh, the short-term one is really to gather as many data sets available that are available in SPNs, PKOs, but, but also in other uh, parts of the departments uh, and make them available for the public. Uh, and, and here um, we follow you know, a standard routine with regard to declassification or classification, just to make it a choice, basically, uh, how this data can be released to the public. But uh, um, in, the, in the long run, we also want to you know, have uh, the space available for more systematic data collection that's you know, potentially confidential or at least for internal consumption only. Now, when it comes to why colleagues should contribute, we'd like to highlight five reasons. One is that it really makes your life easier uh, because you don't have to manually send data and that's happening by emails or you know, in, in you know, child transfer, uh, in, in uh, file transfer format. Uh, it also allows to to integrate data in reporting. And uh, when I turn to Priscilla momentarily, uh, she has an example in that regard how it becomes, you know, the data provided in the hub can provide, be part of, of reporting structures. Uh, it allows us also to have a wider community of practice in the peace and security pillar. So the hub for us is an opportunity to have a conversation with colleagues about data normalization, about more systematic, more disciplined data collection. Uh, so this is a, a hope for us to have a conversation about the transformative change we are after. Uh, it gives data of the United Nations more visibility to peers and, and the public. So it's also, you know, living up to the spirit of a hub to echo, to amplify existing uh, data points. And here the hub is not really duplicating or absorbing existing data points that uh, already exist in the peace and security pillar. Think about, for instance, the uh, repertoire that the uh, Security Council uh, practice section has of, of DPPA, but it rather amplifies and, and provides easy access to those different data points that are already in the public domain. And then lastly, uh, you know, the overall aim is to eventually improve data-driven decision-making. And for that, we need scale. So we need a sufficient amount of data points and data sets in the future, but also then the capability and the understanding how to make use of it. So what the Data Hub also provides are data stories that explain to colleagues and the general public how to make best use of the data provided by the Hub. I pause here and I turn to Christina for more introductory remarks and a demo of the Hub. Over to you, Christina. Excellent. I hope everybody can hear me. I'm going excellent. So I'm going to share my screen as well. Uh, and we're going to walk through the current soft launch site. So you can see there is a thing that actually works with some buttons. You can press them um, and I will put the link in the chat so you can explore on your own as well. Um, just continuing and picking up on what Martin um, had said. Ultimately, we in the peace and security pillar recognize that a lot more support is needed to help bring visibility to, in fact, the mass amount of work that is already underway and make it easier, make it more visible. Um, and really grateful for the opportunity to connect to all of you so that we can begin, I, I would hope, actually a longer dialogue about how the peace and security pillar can be more connected to the community that um, is organized here at large. I'm going to share my screen now. OK. So hopefully you see on your screen uh, the site as it stands now. And it is at psdata.un.org. Uh, .org. OK, so what, what you see here is hopefully an easy to use, very accessible, open design that, like we said, we're trying to address a range of issues um, in terms of accessibility and visibility to the peace and security data and, and make it just as simple and as easy as possible. The, the simple principle of, of KIS, keep it simple, start simple. As we know, many initiatives tend to get more complex over time, especially in the UN. So we started, I think, with some really excellent mentoring and guidance from colleagues in OCHA and colleagues at the World Bank, actually, 
um, on the technical side around the design and keeping it light and open. So if you connect to it now, you'll see that we are starting in a soft launch with around 17 data sets. We hope to really add to that and accelerate over the coming year um, and provides access to things that actually have never really been given accessibility um, before. So at the top, you'll see that there's some fairly simple features, finding data sets, browsing, a how-to section, so those that are a little less familiar, which is very common in peacekeeping missions and the peace and security pillar at large, those that are less familiar with some of the technical aspects begin to understand how analysis and recognize how data is already integrated in their analysis and using more modernized tools and techniques. Uh, data stories, this is where all of the authors or contributing officers can begin to explain more fully how um, analysis is undertaken with different data sets. A learn more, which allows us to recognize the larger community of open data and how specific sets can be used for it to answer more complex questions. Um, an about section and coming soon, the feature is already here, but we're hoping to add greatly to it in the coming months, a, a secure login so that uh, as Martin was saying, you know, there's a short term goal of really getting out an open data portal essentially to make accessible to you, the community, UN partners and member states, um, the, the core data sets in publicly accessible environments. Oh, I hear somebody's microphone. Um, but phase two actually is to expand the capabilities so that there's a secure workspace for colleagues to share internally before we release uh, data to the public uh, and to partners, a secure access area for data exchange uh, internally, kind of a workspace. Uh, as we go down, you know, essentially these same features are repeated again. You'll see some nice pictures that go along with our data stories and getting started with our open data, uh, helping people where if they don't know what they're looking for, uh, and terms and conditions and the Creative Commons references at the bottom. So let's start. So if you were, for example, looking for, or uh, this is a very common scenario, besides the sort of in all of the different issues we're trying to solve. Say, for example, there's a dialogue going on with a member state around safety and security or around peace building or around conflict in a very specific country, say Somalia. These themes help to organize the data sets that are specific to the pillar. Uh, so, for example, if you pick on peace building, immediately it takes you to uh, the find a data set, but with that category already selected. You then have the option to switch to different categories, drill down more specifically to countries you might be looking for, or even missions, both current and past. Uh, as we go for we, we the the reality here, of course, is that you know the UN is a huge repository itself of just a ton of information, and it's just less accessible than we may want it to be. So as we move forward with this this pillar um, project, we are hoping to sort of clean clean up the shop, so to speak. Uh, so you ca the user has the option to select, uh, and then each one of these data sets is described in a simple way and for example if you would look at the peace building priorities let's look at that uh, say we're trying to do some analysis on the specific country about the impact of funds that are provided for peace building projects um, and understand how we're, we're making and having an effect in a certain country. This page describes the data set in a simple way. There's tabs at the top that describe the metadata. Uh, we actually were very grateful to get guidance from DESA colleagues to make sure that some of the metadata fields are um, well understood and using standard terms and look forward to any other feedback, of course, as we go forward. Uh, but here it just describes, you know, the frequency, the organizational owner, any limitations or exceptions, themes, formats, and languages supported. For each of the data sets, there's also a preview, so you can kind of take a look at it before you download or connect via API. 
look at the actual structure. And since this is quite technical and we're trying to essentially provide community support for both technical and substantive here, um, we are giving a preview, but we're also say at the bottom of each one of these, uh, if the headers or definitions that might be associated with the data set are un not well understood, you can sort of take a look at each one of these and there's a definition assigned to each of the column headers. So really making an extra effort to make it accessible as possible to um, also uh, the non-technical audience and begin building commonalities of understanding. Thirdly, there's a download function where you can down literally download the data or as uh, was mentioned earlier, really connect to a modern API um, approach and architecture. The backend architecture is built in Azure. We're really proud to not only sort of from a conceptual point of view, embrace the goals of the SG's data strategy, but also from a technical point of view, really leveraging the best of the current arch enterprise architecture components that we have in the Secretariat, which is Azure and the ability to create automated APIs. Still doing a lot of learning in that area to understand how to do, handle some of the security aspects. Um, so any feedback that colleagues on this call have are, is very welcome in that area. But essentially by connecting via API, what we're able to do, um, this may be very common sense for you, but um, you know, a, a standard desk officer will not necessarily have come with a lot of data skills just right off the bat. So we need to be able to provide easy ways for them to update data. So if they're downloading this set, which describes um, you know, the peace building fund and the priorities, they might connect it to an Excel file. But with an API, you can connect the Excel file directly to the back end and just press refresh in Excel. And that allows a just a little step more to um, for substantive officers to just make it easy, update data that's accurate, consistent, and well maintained. Um, finally, for each of the data sets, there's a discover more tab, which allows, I think, and this is one of the areas that we hope we're going to grow, which is show the complementarity of data sets. Right. We know that complex questions like how, what is the impact of the UN in Somalia, or is peacekeeping getting more dangerous, or um, what is the progress in women, peace and security agenda? These are not answered with a single data set, right? They're answered with almost like a, a prefix meal, like a, a whole set of data. So we're beginning to evolve in this area where we are trying to link together complement uh, complementary data that helps to answer larger questions. Um, so there might be a relevant set on quick impact projects. There might be other um, sources at OCHA or UN data that might help to supplement for an analyst and to help to round out a picture that um, is meant to be provided within a larger dialogue. Uh, so as an example, so that here we also have the data stories. So um, here I'm linking to a story, essentially a blog written by the authoring office, which is PBSO in this case, where they have the opportunity to really explain what this data is all about um, and what it means, what stories it can tell, uh, and provide sample visuals to show how this is supporting some a decision making process. In this case, a peace building funding dashboard. Um, link to other resources so people can learn and understand more uh, and and describe sort of the larger aim of the, the data set. Uh, maybe one I will switch up to very quickly and then I think we'll we'll open it up for Q&A in just a moment. Uh, but a few other key components of the site uh, again, we're trying to build bridges between different communities and sort of raise the levels overall for data capability in the pillar. Um, is a how to section. So it explains the site, but very specifically, it has some tutorials on how to pull data using APIs, an explanation of the API structure, an ability for people to contact us so that we can engage and get people the help that they need. Uh, and Besides data stories, there's also the learn more section. And I think this is an area that I would probably um, 
about the entire site, of course, and the initiative really welcome feedback and questions. But this is an area where I think we're going to grow more, which is like, how does all this data help to answer larger questions? In the learn more, what we do have right now is a link to all of the other, let's say, data hubs or portals, the open data portals, where we know people are already connecting to get evidence that helps to answer questions, whether it's on, I'll give you an example. So um, in the past year, we did a special report and a kind of a special data analysis for one of our ASGs on the impact of COVID on, in Africa. And, in, and, and that impact is not just about the pandemic, right? We can go to uh, World Health Organization API and grab the data there, but we also grab data from migration, from IOM, We'll grab data from ACLED, which is a you know a civil society organization that that counts violent incidents. Um, we'll grab data from the Fragile States Index, from colleagues at UNDP, um, the Human Development Index, and others to help really tell a larger story about the impact of COVID in Africa. So this is an area I think that we're hoping to really expand and grow, and maybe this is fruit for um, conversation here. Is how can we how can we answer larger questions about peace and security using the data sets that we have than we know that we're already using to to inform analysis. Um, finally, there's an about us section, which really just kind of grounds us and provides a, a, a disclaimer and a link so that anybody can contact us at any time. Um, future growth next steps. We're formally launching this. Uh, site in a larger way at the World Data Forum. So we're very grateful for colleagues um, that are even <laughs> in this call potentially uh, for helping us with that. And we look forward to seeing you there. Uh, and the larger growth, I think I mentioned a couple of different areas where we're hoping to really evolve the, the initiative, work with colleagues and partners, be part of a a larger open data community and then build out an internal exchange architecture uh, so that internally we have we begin to kind of break down the silos that um, sometimes prevent us from doing better coordinated and uh, um, operational response and and really take advantage of the resources that we have in the organization whether it's in the Peace and Security Pillar, or it's in the DESA and the st statistician community, um, or in the UN partners at large, UNDP, OCHA, others have all been very, very um, supportive and um, have provided a lot of feedback to us so far. So I'm going to pause uh, and maybe if Martin, if you're still on, we can both turn on our cameras or our Alexander, Sasha, uh, back over to you for Q&A. Thank you so much. Thank you, Christina and Martin, uh, for this presentation. Uh, there are already a good number of questions in the chat, and I also see that uh, Ivana is also already trying to answer some of those. I would nevertheless still like to pick up uh, some of those questions um, right now in, in the Q&A, also because in the recording we usually don't see the uh, what is happening in the chat. So um, let me maybe start by one question uh, from uh, Shalini. Shalini, I don't know if you want to unmute yourself and ask the question yourself. Please do so. Hi, um, thank you. Thanks, Christina, Martin and Alexander. Excellent, excellent presentation. And I'm already on the PS Data Hub looking through and playing around. So it's good. Um, my question was essentially to know the source of the data for all the various data sets. Uh, Joanna did answer saying, because it's external facing right now, that is not uh, something you're publishing, which is fair and understood. Uh, but I was just curious. Thanks. Yeah, so also the question, if this uh, more granular or information is basically available then for internal UN users, maybe. Yeah, I mean, I guess mainly it was uh, motivated by is all the data here from, you know, a system of record type of source or is some of it also uh, not necessarily uh, certified or vetted, but because that's the only place we have certain data sets, it's here. 
Mm. So is it is all the data on the data hub uh, official? I guess that's the question. Martin, would you want me to take that? OK, <laughs> so everything that's on the public site has been officially vetted and approved for declassification if necessary. So it's fully public. It can be used by anybody, anywhere, at any time, um, and including, of course, UN partners. I think the login button on the top right, I, we didn't really go into that, but essentially it's push, pushing us towards phase two of the development where we would be able to share data that doesn't necessarily go through the rigor of official vetting for public release, uh, but is still from authoritative sources. So on the second part of your question, though, authoritative sources, yes, it, so the data, um, if you go to any of the data sets, actually, you'll see, you know, who owned the organization right now, I think, is just United Nations. Of course, there's a much more granular identification of the office that probably roughly you could already guess anyway if you get out the org chart. Um, but because they're, I mean, just recognizing that, especially for the peace and security pillar, this is a larger change management issue, right? Which is really yeah. understanding and standing behind authoritative ownership of data and having in place a really well understood process for um, ownership, for the difference between ownership and custodianship. This is a larger change management issue. So as mm -hmm. we work towards those things, and I think as we participate in the larger data strategy community, let's say, in, which very importantly includes OICT, um, we use common terminology, right? So if we have a more granular something there noted at some point, we just want to get the term right, whether it's data owner or data custodian or what. I don't think some of these terms are actually really well understood, nor are they set in policy that we can refer to in, an, in a hard written sense. But I think that's coming with the data strategy work that's underway. And I think in the internal login section that we're developing, we'll probably be able to get more specific um, and and just keep pushing forward in an incremental way. I hope that helps to answer your question, Shalini. Oh, absolutely. Thanks for joining. Nice to see you. <laughs> of course. Thank you. Thanks, Christina, Martin, Alexander. Thank you. Um, so there was an, another question also by Tanya, which went into a similar direction, but she um, also asked whether there is a list of criteria for the inclusion of data sets into the Peace and Security Data Hub. Maybe I take this one. So John already helpfully answered it, but uh, just for those who can't read the answers, uh, the main aim in the first stage is uh, make, to make uh, data publicly available, right? So that was one of the main criteria. So we can show and shine, show and shine, right? When you start something new and innovation, you want to show and shine. So that's that was one of the main kind of investment criteria in the beginning. Um, let me just point out one more thing here, which is about the, the terminology peace and security, right? Because there's an ongoing debate in the General Assembly, but also in the council about what does actually fall into this domain. And we started as an initiative with an eye on the smaller peace and security pillar, which is DPPA, DPO, but we're already having an eye and having conversations with the larger peace and security pillar, which includes our colleagues at OCT, which used to be part of, of DPPA, which includes colleagues on, on the uh, um, ODC side, for instance, you know, crime, et cetera. When you look at SDG 16, that's certainly uh, a part of, 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 of the larger peace and security agenda, but also uh, includes uh, colleagues from the test plan organization, for instance, right? We have a small, peer group and headquarters that brings together different colleagues from the wider peace and security pillar. And the aim is to grow that in different stages uh, so that uh, the utility is there. And to be frank, at one point, you know, when we really talk about integrated analysis, there, there should be just, you know, data or UN data. It shouldn't be just the di differentiation between peace and security data and humanitarian data. Where does that stop? Where does that end? But we're still far from that. Um, the second point that I wanted to point out here is with regard to a deliberate choice we made when it came to how do we set up this hub, we decided not to run this like HDX. HDX, as you all know, is a system where you can upload data sets, you know, you know, as you like, as you please, like Harvard Dataverse and others. 
we wanted to keep this much more boutique -ish because of the concerns that exist when it comes to anything that is in the Council of Peace and Security is often equalized with being politicized, you know, just because it's peace and security, it's, it's, it's understood to be political and hence sensitive, right? Whenever we talk about political issues, we perceive this to be sensitive. And, and in that context, we wanted to have that additional layer of um, quality control that Casino just mentioned. But eventually, this is not just quality control. This is about, you know, usability of the data. Because it's not just about vetting the data. It's about having suitable data so that we can actually compare, right? So we can actually predict. Uh, and, and that's why we made this deliberate choice of having those layers that um, make, it, make us in the beginning at least a bit more selective in terms of what gets uh, on the hub. Hope that answers also a few of the questions that they were that were raised in the in the chat. Thank you. Um, then I see a couple of questions around uh, software of the front end and of the back end. Um, I don't know Ling Yang or Sean if you want to come in. Uh, Sean, I see your face, so please go ahead. <laughs> yeah. Hey. Hey. Can you hear me? Let's check. Yeah. Yeah, awesome. No, I, I got to say, I just want to say, first of all, I mean, it, it's it's fantastic that your team has put this together, that you've managed to, you know, think through the problem and trying to get data out and, and exposing it to the public. I mean, because this, we, we just came from another call where this was another, it's just a recurring conversation that we have about how to get data out into into statistical offices, but also into data analysts and this sort of thing. So, so first of all, fantastic. But I, I'm a software engineer myself, so I, and I tend to really, um, I like, I like internal open source, I like collaboration, I like working with other people. And I think one of the, the great trends that we've seen in, in software engineering is, is sort of contributing to a code base, you know, across distributed teams, you know, people who may not be part of the original design team may see a feature that may fork your code, like the like what HDX did with CCAN, you know. I mean, CCAN is just the public fork of CCAN and they've added some some features, which is fantastic, right? So um, in that in that spirit, you know, being able to build on the work of other people is kind of a critical um, principle of software engineering in a sense. And it is very challenging in the UN because we tend to have a culture of secrecy. Our code tends to be something that we guard, um, like our social security numbers, which is fine. Uh, but it does prevent collaboration. It does encourage people to sort of reinvent the wheel. And then within a within a year, you're gonna have Office X basically having their own data hub. And it's good. So what I would love to see is a, is a vision where we sort of have more trust, more collaboration among the software teams. And obviously I can't, you know, it's your it's your project, but I wanted to know, have you considered this uh, to have some sort of an internal open source policy? It doesn't have to be an actual open source license. It can be a, a different license, but you can say, okay, you know, if you're in the UN, we can, uh, and we see a feature, instead of having a bunch of people create their own, we'd say, hey, would you be, you know, consider adding this feature to your software so we could use it for our separate um, purpose, you know, very similar, but maybe a distinct um, context. So this sort of thing I, I think is, is a sort of, um, it's a superpower. It's, it's how trust can turn and turn very small teams into very productive, um, productive teams. So I, I thought this was one thing and I, and I was curious to know if it was based on CCAN because I was hoping that you guys did use either HDX or CCAN in the background, but it sounds like you, you didn't. So is, was CCAN involved in any way in the process? I'll take this one. Um, no, it wasn't. Uh, however, I think, I mean, you raised such excellent points, honestly. And um, coming from an academic family myself, you know, I mean, the idea of open knowledge, generation, collaborative creation together of new new ways of thinking and knowledge it's just second nature. However, um, you know, we just have to recognize, obviously, that there's some constraints of the organization to control ICT costs. And so it's just a balance that I think that we need to continue to work on to find, frankly. Um, I mean, full transparency, we created this project from a technical aspect. We've been concepting it, I think, for over two years, actually, um, with a kind of a group of us motivated data people uh, love innovation and want to take on solve problems um, but technically in fact we were given very little time to show a proof of concept and so we used what we had at hand um, and we are very dependent because of the the way I think some of the synchronizing and the timing issues we're just very dependent on the enterprise systems that are at hand in the secretariat and I think the pressures 
I'm guessing the pressures might be a slightly different or maybe it's just a perception of that um, in the pillar because we're so, we've typically been very dependent on kind of VIP tech service for over a decade and that changed during the reform. So a lot of things transformed and moved all around and some of the tools that we had previously were not then subsequently available to us and we were pushed very hard to move into Office 365 and, and the Microsoft suite. All of that is to say that um, I totally recognize your concerns and I think we, we need to collectively continue to articulate that to our ICT colleagues together, um, counting ourselves in that community too, right? Uh, it's not an us versus them. We're all in this together. But I also think um, that the door is not closed or anything. Uh, OCHA, HDX, I mean, Humanitarian Data Center directly collaborated with us to be able to influence the concepting and design um, and work through some of the ownership issues, like Martin was saying, so that we could differentiate actually ourselves as well and be good partners uh, from a complementary point of view, um, regardless of the technology. But I'll, just one last note is that, you know, this the, from an archi purely technical architectural point of view, um, in fact, there is a lot of discussion about how either the concepts and or the architectural design and or the technology can be scaled up and out for other components in the secretariat. And the SG's office has really taken the lead on that conversation. Um, and I certainly think that there's space in that conversation for more emphasis to be placed on open source um, in addition to our corporate partners that provide the you know the enterprise solutions. I think there's still space. So um, I think, yeah, let's connect afterwards and see what we can do to, to introduce the, the concept. Over. Yeah, just to, just to follow up. I mean, I, I didn't mean to, I, I love enterprise stuff as well. I just meant it, sometimes you have an, um, the infrastructure as code approach, which means that regardless of whether you have, you know, using Microsoft or open source, you have basically uh, your architecture is in a code repository where people can sort of view it and decide whether they want to adopt it as their own architecture, whereas sometimes there's a more traditional approach where there's, so more, maybe it's a more technical conversation, but having that source of truth would allow, regardless of the approach you chose, other people to, you know, to contribute to it as well. And yeah, that's what own. I'm seeing. Sorry, in that, in that conversation that the SG's office is actually leading, um, I think the concept of having more open designs, you know, functional specs, um, all of the descriptive documentation, et cetera, and, and the actual code open to a larger community, that is certainly in play. So let's, let's ask for that. Thanks. Um, le I'm looking at some of the other questions that are coming up. I see some questions by Gerardo Guzman here uh, around very specific uh, details of a, a data set. So I, I won't um, call on Gerardo there. I guess uh, you will. You can follow up with Gerardo later on to to get him um, the detailed information that he needs. Or he's looking for. I have another question by Noah uh, uh, around the question of dashboards, reports, and so on. Noah, uh, do you want to unmute yourself and ask your question, please? Yeah, thank you for uh, uh, this amazing presentation. Yeah, just like the question is in the chat, uh, will you be uh, adopting that OCHA model of not only uh, uh, um, releasing and sharing data sets, but also the products that come out of them, you know, the analysis uh, that that is done from this data. Will you be uh, sharing it on this portal? Noah, you're still there. I can't hear you. I, I can hear him. I, he, uh, okay. Uh, Hello. So the, the question is in the chat. So um, Christina Martin, if you have already yeah. uh, seen I it. Can I can answer can that. And, yeah, and I heard the question as well. So maybe there was an audio uh, thing. So just a just a quick response. Um, you see that we have a section on data stories, right? So there's a block feature on the hub which tells you a little bit of how this data can be used. Will we share the analysis? Probably not, because those are 
you know, often confidential notes that go to the Secretary General, SRSDs, force commanders for, for very strategic decision making. And we wouldn't expose ourselves to, you know, external review with regard to certain political decisions that are, you know, based on, on the data that are used. But I think the, the block and, and this kind of community part is, is an opportunity to see how, from a methodology perspective, you know, the, the data is used for decision making. And that's where we invite, you know, anybody who uh, was a data provider, but also a data user to help help us think that through, because one of the biggest challenges we are, have already heard or discovered is, you know, it's not just nice to have uh, a data repository, we need to make good use of it and we need to make, uh, uh, you know, transparent use of it. Uh, and, and, and for that, we are building this internal community of practice where we have a series of brown bags, uh, uh, even on the peace and security side, we have our own brown bag series. Uh, we have a, a series of trainings and, and peer groups where we come together and we learn from each other. Uh, but but in the long run, I think making those analytical pieces available, that's again, we are a bit different than HDX, will, will probably not to be the case, apart from sharing the methodology, right? How how do we go about it? What do we do with it? How do we connect the data? That That is something we potentially grow further in the future. And maybe if I could chime in a little bit as well, like the, the idea, of course, is that data is it's not totally neutral, um, but it essentially can be used for multiple analyses, right? So there's not just one way of interpreting um, even things like fatalities or casualties, unfortunately. There's there's many different higher order questions that each data set actually can help to, un help to unpack and understand in the dialogue that we have that that uses evidence to sort of prop up what we're trying to say or or trying to answer to with member states and partners. So I think we weren't necessarily pushing the visualization too hard at this point, but I think the feedback is really helpful. Um, I, what we wanted to do is just leave it open so that the data could be answering multiple questions. But um, certainly we've been getting this feedback from a couple of different sources so it's good food for thought for us and also to help us you know sustain some some support for some of the visuals uh so thank you though noah for the feedback over thank you um sorry i had a, apparently a little audio glitch on my side so if you understood noah well i didn't uh sorry for that um i have another question here from tanya from um as, um, up. Tanya, maybe you want to come in? I can. Thank you, Alexander. And actually, it's the UNICEF now, but thank you. <laughs> Doesn't matter. All good. So, um, sorry for that. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> not a problem at all. No, I was just having a quick browse of the data sets. I mean, it looks super exciting. Thanks, guys, for pulling this together. It looks like a big effort. Um, and it looks like most of the data is administrative data. Um, I mean, I was just browsing it quickly, so I might be wrong here, but it would be good if you could comment maybe a little bit on that and whether, you know, you mentioned that you were planning to add additional data sets and so on, whether you're thinking beyond administrative data or you just love administrative data as much as I do. And nice to see you, Martin. <laughs> Hi, hi, Tanya. Good, good to see you uh, uh, or hear you uh, uh, in that regard. Um, there are there are data sets that are more substantial, not just administrative. Take the, I mean, depends on what what you call administrative data, right? But take the, take the data of the Security Council, where it describes the practice of the Council, or data on uh, peace agreements, for instance, right? Which is based on the separate data project we have just on peace agreements, which is the language of peace, a separate project that DPPA. The mediation colleagues have together with the University of Cambridge, uh, which looks at you know any peace agreement that is facilitated by the by the United Nations. But what we are what we're doing is a salami tactic, like slice by slice, right? We we grab anything we can get. Uh, we have some aviation data I heard from our uh, IMU colleagues coming soon, which might not sound you know um, too substantial in the beginning, but but might be relevant for you know detecting patterns in the future. So we grab any any slice we get. And, and will diversify and, and grow in the future. That's that's kind of the, the long-term strategy here. And brings me to another point. If you, uh, that was, is a shout out to all of you. If you see anything that you think should be added, if you have any ideas, you know, for additional data points we should integrate, please let us know. You know, this is really, 
this is an opportunity uh, to gather uh, um, uh, points together and, and, and you know, make them available. That's kind of, we just want to create the infrastructure because in the past we didn't have an infrastructure. We had laptops with Excel sheets that got deleted and you know, cluttered, a cluttered infrastructure, which was no infrastructure. So if you see anything, if, uh, particularly those working in regional commissions, we're in touch with, with, uh, with ESQA already, where, where they have a conflict related unit, for instance, that work on peace and security issues. Uh, anything that comes your way where, where you think, you know, that should be added to the peace and security data hub, let us know and then it would be great to integrate that. Over. Thank you. Um, I would have mm, a question myself uh, as well. So um, you said that the data, at least which is publicly available, has been vetted before and so on. Um, you also, the goal of this project is to have an easy and simple platform for people to, to share the information that is produced in uh, peacekeeping missions or in uh, any other UN entity and provide the data with you. In those data sets, um, do you also have uh, data sets which contain, um, I would say, micro data, so uh, data which is potentially um, sensitive and could identify single persons or entities. Uh, maybe you can say a little bit about that. Thanks. Should I take that? Um, no, we do not at this point. Uh, first, publicly in public information really can't include any PII anyway. Um, and I think we're all anticipating some upcoming guidance on privacy. Um, data privacy that is uh, in draft right now, in fact, on and and will help us understand on an architectural level how we're meant to introduce design concepts into different data architectures that will um, prevent or limit the risks, right, related to to microdata. Um, I, so right now, no, um, it, it, that's part of the vetting process. Uh, and potential declassification process. But um, in the internal exchange functions that we're building out, this is an excellent question, right? Because we all know that it, risk is not binary. There are layers of risk. And so, you know, concatenating some data sets to other data sets helps to, can help to narrow down to, you know, potentially smaller numbers of individual people in, in many cases. Um, it's something that we're actively aware of and hoping to, re and actually already contributing to some of the policy discussions, uh, looking forward to, to implementing them. For the short term, I think we're trying to avoid that, that risk altogether by just having as aggregated data as possible where, it, where there's any sensitivity, um, and then you know, work through the, the vetting process pretty carefully. So no sensitive data right now. Thank you for clarifying this. And uh, yeah, um, I don't. I think we have covered all the questions in the chat, uh, in one way or the other. So either in the chat or live. Uh, if are there any other questions? Does somebody want to come in um, at this point? So. I don't see anything. If you want to come in, please raise your hand. Um, otherwise, I, I would uh, then conclude this uh, UNSC brown bag. Also by saying that if you have further questions, of course, I guess Christina and Martin will be more than happy to, to answer all those. I also saw a comment from Enrico, who is working in UNODC. So um, he said, OK, he had to leave and we'll uh, try to connect with you after the webinar. Um, so thank you again, Christina and Martin, for this great presentation. Thank you to all uh, attendees in this UNSD brown bag um, for your questions. Um, I see that we have one more question, Cecile. Uh, please go ahead, and then after this one, then we conclude. Cecile. Hi. I do apologize. Thank you very much. I was listening on and off, so I may have missed it. 
I wanted to find out if geospatial data is included in this Peace and Security Data Hub. I'll take that one really quickly. Um, no, GIS data is not included. I think the technical complications, um, actually I did not say so beforehand, but we were we basically built this whole thing in about two months. Uh, so just keep that in mind. So obviously there are later phases, um, but there are no plans to include GIS data. However, I think that as we go forward there, they, it is a definite kind of concern that where data can be geolocated using lat long that we would encourage that absolutely and also gender disaggregated those sort of two principles of design we're trying to cultivate um, in data sets and and with you know different offices that may or may not know that they can do that or that you know somebody did it once and it was really helpful but it just was it didn't take somehow um, so no GIS data per se but um, data that includes latitude, longitude, definitely we are encouraging that as well as gender disaggregated data over. Thanks for asking. Thank you. So um, with this, I think uh, we conclude the Q&A session. As I said, so if people want to reach out, please do so. Also, um, let me take this opportunity to make a little bit more advertisement for our global network of data officers and statisticians, which is a great place to exchange ideas and uh, ask questions about anything related to statistics, data and geospatial information. Um, so thank you again uh, for joining today and have a great uh, rest of the week. Thank you. Thank you so much, colleagues. Bye. Stay healthy. Thank you. Bye-bye.